Well, hello, Canopy Roads. Uh, thank you for tuning in via live stream. I have been so looking forward to sharing this Good Friday service with you. I know this is still very different for us. Um, we're used to being physically together. I am still in no way, shape, or form used to the new normal, so to speak. I, I miss seeing all of you. I miss seeing your faces. I miss hearing your voices, but I know this is not going to last forever. And so I'm looking forward to uh, that, that day when we'll be able to uh, spend time together again. I hope that's sooner rather than later. Thanks again for being here. If this is your first time tuning in to a message or, or watching via live stream, one of our messages here at Canopy Roads, we just wanted to say welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, we do not believe that you're watching by accident. We do not believe that it's a coincidence that you're watching. In fact, I actually think this is the perfect time for you to be joining us, and I'll tell you why. Our church has been in a sermon series, really kind of a, more of a journey through the gospel of Mark for about 10 weeks, and we are actually at the focal point of our story. We're at the climax of the story. It's not the end of the story, but it's definitely the climax. And so we're glad that you're here. We think this is going to be a perfect message for you, and I hope that this encourages you in your faith. And like Vance said, this is Good Friday, and Good Friday is part of what the church has historically referred to as Holy Week. And Holy Week is really all about uh, reflecting on and meditating on those events that bring us up to Easter Sunday. It's about preparing our hearts to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. And we started this whole thing off last Sunday, Palm Sunday, and we celebrated and remember Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And he comes in to the city a little differently than we would expect. He doesn't come in on, you know, a war horse. He actually comes in on a colt. He doesn't come in surrounded by a bunch of soldiers wielding broad swords. He actually comes in and he's surrounded by people just like you, just like me, who are waving palm branches. And they say, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. You know, we had Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. Those are considered holy days as well. On Monday, we remember Jesus clearing or almost cleansing the temple there in Jerusalem. On Tuesday, we remember Jesus giving his Olivet Discourse. On Wednesday, Jesus is anointed at Bethany. Bethany's this small little town right outside of Jerusalem, and he's staying there in someone's house. And while he's staying there, a woman comes in, and she's got a really expensive jar of perfume. She opens it up. She pours it all over Jesus, and his disciples are kind of taken aback by that. They, they wonder, why was this, this perfume that's so valuable, you know, quote-unquote, wasted on Jesus? And he says, no, no, no. He says, leave her alone. He said, what she's done is actually a very, very beautiful thing. He says, she has anointed me beforehand for my burial. She was preparing Jesus, helping Jesus prepare for his death. Yesterday was Thursday. On Thursday of this week, we remember Jesus' last supper with his disciples there in the upper room. It's during that meal that Jesus takes some bread. He breaks it, passes it around to everybody, and he says, take, eat. He says, this is my body given for you. In a similar way, he takes the cup there at the meal, passes it around, and he says, this cup, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. And then we come to Friday of that week, Good Friday. What is Good Friday all about? Good Friday is the anniversary of the crucifixion of Jesus. Good Friday is all about the cross. Good Friday is about trying to make time stand still, in a sense, freezing that moment, you know, pressing the pause button, so to speak, so that we can take that long hard look at the cross of Christ. Good Friday is all about the cross. And so that's what we want to be all about tonight right here. In just a, in just a few moments, I'm going to open up the scriptures. We're going to read. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about it. And then at the end of the service, 
we're going to share a time of communion together. I want to lead us through that. I've got my bread and my cup here. I know that many of you are ready in that respect as well. If you're watching and you don't have these things uh, ready yet, there is still time. Uh, If you're watching from your home, go ahead and get some bread or some juice if you have it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, we wanted to encourage you to join us in that towards the end of the service. You know, I've been praying for this service all week that it really would be a a special time for us. Um, You know, I know that this Easter season is completely different for every single person. Most of us, you know, usually have places that we would go, people that we would see, things that we would do, and because of the crisis that we're in, many of those things, if not all of those things, have actually been canceled. So the whole feel of Easter this year is quite different. And so really my prayer has been that just because it's different, we wouldn't think that it's any less or any worse. Sometimes different can actually be a good thing. Different can be good when it causes you to uh, see things in a fresh way or to rethink why we celebrate the way we do in the first place. So my prayer has been that this would be a time where your heart is encouraged, that your faith is strengthened, and that you would very literally see and savor Jesus like you never have before. Why don't we pray together and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, I I pray right now that you would help us to just slow down. Help me to slow down. Father, we don't want to rush through our time together and this just be another service that we watched, that we attended. Lord, we, we want to make the most of this time. And so we pray and ask that right now you would help us to enter the Good Friday story. In just a second, we're going to open up the scriptures. We don't want to fly through the scriptures and read them as though we were some sort of you know, passive spectator. We want to experience this story. We want to enter into the Good Friday story. Father, remind us of your sacrifice. I pray that you would remind us of what salvation cost you. Remind us of the price that Jesus paid to rescue us from our captivity to sin. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would impress upon us the punishment that Jesus actually bore on our behalf. I pray that you'd give us eyes to see these things. Give us eyes to see your all-sufficient sacrifice in a new, fresh way so that our hearts just can't help but overflow with praise, that our affections are stirred up like never before, and that we just, we walk away from this with a greater appreciation, a greater sense of thanksgiving and awe for your great grace and your wonderful love. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mentioned earlier that the crucifixion is really kind of the focal point of the gospel story, especially in the gospel of Mark. The cross is really the climax of the story. It's not the end of the story, but it's the climax of the story, and it's where he's been guiding us and leading us and pushing us this whole time, ever since the beginning of his gospel. You know, early on in the gospel, Jesus begins his ministry, and he starts doing all these amazing signs and wonders. He he, uh, cleanses lepers, He heals people of all kinds of diseases. He's casting out demons. He's raising people from the dead. He's multiplying food. He's feeding thousands upon thousands. He's even walking on water, and his disciples are there. They get to witness this. They get to be a part of this. They're so excited. They get to be called and counted as one of Jesus' disciples. They're a part of this kingdom of God movement. They're thrilled. And then chapter 8 comes in the gospel of Mark, and they enter this city called Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asks them a question. He says, who do the people say that I am? Who do the people say that I am? And, you know, they kind of look around and say, well, Jesus, there's, there's a lot of opinions about that. Some say, you know, you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Other people say, Maybe you're one of the prophets from of old, and then he turns the question on them, and he says, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up. He says, well, you're the Christ. 
You are the Christ. And this is a major, major turning point, a huge transition in the story, because it is from this point forward, Jesus begins to tell them something they did not expect. Jesus begins to explain to them that a good Friday is actually coming. That a good Friday is on the horizon in the plainest language possible. In the simplest terms that he can can use, Jesus says, of speaking of himself, I have got to suffer at the hands of these religious people. And ultimately, I'm going to be handed over to the Roman government, and they're going to put me to death. I'm going to be killed. And the disciples cannot fathom this. They have a hard time grasping what Jesus is talking about. You have to remember that for a first century Jew, the idea that the Savior would be suffering was very, very counterintuitive. The idea of a suffering Messiah almost seemed oxymoronic, like they contradicted the two. The Messiah, the anointed one, this guy, he's supposed to rule. This guy, he's supposed to reign. He's supposed to overrun the Romans. He's supposed to reestablish Israel as this, you know, national superpower. What's all this Good Friday talk? What is so good about the death of the Christ? Why should the Messiah have to end up hanging from a cross? And this is where Mark has been leading us and taking us from the very, very beginning all the way to this moment in time, almost where time stands still and you see Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, he's hoisted up onto a cross for all to see. Let's read together in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 21, I'm going to go through verse 39. This is the word of God, it says this. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He can't even save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemme sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, putting it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Truly, this man was the Son of God. You know, three times while Jesus is on the cross, he is mocked, he is taunted by these people who essentially tell him, why don't you come down, Jesus? Why don't you save yourself? The first time, it's by these people who are just passing by. It's the bystanders. It's the people who just wanted to come by and see the show. You know, and they say, man, Jesus, you talked all this big talk about destroying the temple, rebuilding it in three days, and now look at you. You can't even save yourself. The second time, it's the chief priests and the scribes, basically the religious people, the religious leaders of the day. 
They walk by Jesus laughing. You know, he can save all these other people. He can't even save himself. Let's let this king of the Jews, king of Israel, come on down so that we can see and believe who you say you really are. And then the last time, if you can even believe this, some of the people who were crucified next to Jesus actually say some of the same things. In the Gospel of Luke, we read that one of the the criminals who's being crucified basically says, Jesus, come on, get down from here and bring us down with you. Save yourself and save us. Everybody's lobbing this at Jesus. Come on down, Jesus. Save yourself. But he doesn't do it. Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, stays on the cross. And you have to ask why. I think this passage gives us some answers, and I want to share some of them with you. I think the first reason is this. Jesus stays on the cross to pay the price for your sin. Jesus stays on the cross to pay the price for your sin, and I hope that you don't just gloss over that. It kind of sounds like the Sunday school question and answer. You know, the Sunday school teacher says, well, why does Jesus die on the cross? And everybody knows the answer, you know, to pay for our sins. But I think if we were to really take Good Friday seriously, if we were really just to, to look at Jesus, to gaze upon the cross, I think that the reality that he pays the price for your sin and my sin that when we totally get that and we understand that, that should absolutely overwhelm us. You see, it's not like Jesus is paying for your sin in some sort of abstract, distant way. Jesus very literally takes on your sin, my sin, the sin of the whole world. So that means that every sort of rebellious thought that I've ever had Every careless word that I've ever spoken, every evil deed that I've ever done, a life's worth of disobedience, a life's worth of just filth and junk has been transferred to Jesus, and by his blood, he actually pays the price for your sin and for my sin and for the sin of the whole world. 1 Peter 2, 24. In speaking of Jesus, he writes, He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And I think this is so critical to not only this passage, but just grasping the good news in general. If you don't see your sin on the Savior, I highly doubt that you're going to view your Savior on the cross. You've got to see your sin first on the Savior before you can see your Savior on the cross. And so in order to to help us see that, I want to flip over now to a passage of Scripture. I just want to read it to you. This is from the Old Testament. This is from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, and he talks about just that. Listen to these words. He says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? 
And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Pray with me. Father, it is almost incomprehensible that you made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. We thank you for your great display of love. We know that this is love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So thank you so much, Jesus, for your gift on the cross. Thank you for giving up your life, paying the price of our sin, for canceling our sin debt that stood against us and making peace by the blood of your cross. Amen. Not only does Jesus stay on the cross to pay the price for your sin, Jesus stays on the cross to take the punishment your sin deserves. Jesus stays on the cross to take the punishment your sin deserves. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and he is pleading to his father to provide another way. He's basically saying, God, I know that you can do all things. I know that nothing is impossible with you. He says, please remove this cup from me. That cup being the full weight of God's wrath and his judgment against sin. And I can just I can just picture Jesus looking into this, knowing full well what is on the other side, what, what, knowing full well what is to come and looking at it and just being distraught over this. It's almost like a son pleading with his dad and he's saying, Father, please, if there's any other way, if there's any other way that we can accomplish this, any other workaround, let's do that. He asks three times and he says, but not my will. He says, but yours be done. And on the cross, there are these almost strange events that happen that really highlight the fact, get this, that Jesus doesn't just take the cup. Jesus drinks the cup all the way down to the last drop. One of these strange events is this darkness that seems to kind of overshadow the whole scene. Mark says it's from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. This darkness is over the whole place. This darkness is really reminiscent of another time when darkness came over the land in the Old Testament. If you remember with me all the way back to the days of Moses when the Israelites are in Egypt, God sends these ten plagues onto Egypt before the Exodus. One of those plagues was a plague of utter darkness for three days. It signified and signaled God's curse and his judgment over the land. But now we see it here at the crucifixion. But this time, the darkness is not over Egypt. The darkness is directed right at his son. And then, out of nowhere, there's this almost surprising and terrifying shout and cry from Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you really think about it, those are terrifying words. Jesus is experiencing not necessarily a physical pain, though that is true. He's experiencing a pain that he has never experienced in all of eternity. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus, the one who has lived in complete unity and oneness with the Father, is now completely cut off from him. He's experiencing total separation, utter forsakenness from God. And you know, our sin really invites those things 
on us. It invites punishment. Our sin invites judgment. We were the ones who actually deserved darkness and forsakenness and separation from God. But Jesus on the cross willingly takes our punishment that our sin deserved. Father, thank you so much that Jesus took the darkness that our sin deserved and now by faith in him we can actually live into the light. Jesus, thank you so much for taking the punishment that my sin deserved because now by faith in you I can actually walk into and step into the presence of God. Jesus, you, you drank the cup of God's wrath all the way down to the dregs so we wouldn't have to. Thank you for this gift of grace. Amen. Amen. And lastly, Jesus stays on the cross to make provision for your salvation. Jesus stays on the cross to make provision for your salvation. Something huge and monumental happens at the moment of Jesus' death. Mark says, right when Jesus breathes his last, something happens. The temple curtain, it is torn in two, not from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom. You see, the, in, inside the temple in Jerusalem, there was this special place. It was called the Holy of Holies, and it was separated by this massive curtain. And only one time a year, by one person, the high priest, would, would that high priest enter into that special place where there, the presence of the living God was, and he would make atonement for the people of Israel. And on the cross, Jesus changes that forever. The sacrifice of Jesus because of the atonement of Jesus Sin no longer separates us from God. At the death of Jesus, this curtain is ripped in two. He blows the doors wide open so that now, by faith in Jesus, we can have complete access to the living God. And you actually see this played out right after this. In verse 39, Mark writes, And when the centurion who stood facing him, saw that in this way Jesus breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the first time in the Gospel of Mark where a person actually calls Jesus the Son of God. And it's not who you'd expect. It's not an Israelite. It's not a Jew. It's not somebody from Jesus' family. It's not a close friend. It's not one of his disciples. It's not Peter. It's not James. It's not John. It is a Roman centurion. It's a Gentile. It's the Roman centurion, the very guy who has been presiding over this entire crucifixion scene, gets it. He's looking at Jesus and he makes this confession that just rings out into all the world that the kingdom of God has come. That there's actually hope to be found in Jesus that salvation has been secured on the cross. You see, the big idea of this whole passage is this. That Jesus stayed on the cross so that you wouldn't stay in your sin. Jesus stayed on the cross so that you wouldn't stay in your sin. That's what Good Friday is really all about. That's why we're able to look at something so horrific, so torturous as this, and to see that Jesus was actually victorious. That's how we're able to, to call this day good in the first place. And when you really look at it, this was and this is really a Good Friday. And so in just a second, I want to invite Vance to come up. And we're going to have a time of, of communion. I'm going to flip over to another passage of Scripture. And as I, as I get here, uh, my hope would be this. It's that because we've spent a little bit of time looking at the cross and talking about what that means for 
salvation, that as we get ready to take this communion meal, that it would kind of, it would kind of fill this out. It would make it a little bit more robust. It's so easy to actually go through the motions, you know, come to a church service, participate in one, you know, go through these rituals and not really think about it. But like I mentioned earlier, because this is different, because we've kind of camped out on this passage, I pray that this meal would have a little bit more meaning, a little bit more significance for you this Easter season. So what I plan to do here as Vance plays is to read through 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to start at verse 23, and I'm going to use this as a, as a guiding text for us. Paul writes this beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I've got my, my bread here, and I know that many of you have got yours as well. And what I'd like to do is, as Vance plays, is just to give you some time to uh, pass this around, maybe with some family members or friends, and for you just to spend some time in prayer thinking about what Jesus has done for you on the cross. So I'll give you that time and then we'll come together at the end and we'll take this as one. Verse 25, Paul writes, In the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And he says this at the end. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so in the same way, I've got my juice here. I know that you've got your cup ready as well. Uh, again, I want to give you some time in your home there to pass this around if that's what you're doing uh, and also to pray. And so again, just take some time thinking about what the blood of Christ means for you, how it's purchased the forgiveness of your sins. We'll come together at the end and we'll take this as one. of the new covenant and his blood. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time tonight. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for loving the world so much that you actually gave your son on the cross so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for your amazing love. We thank you for this wonderful gift, and we thank you for this time that we've been able to come together, even though virtually, and really look and gaze upon Jesus. I pray that this service and this Easter season would truly be a time where we see and savor Jesus like never before. Amen.